our five most uh, active researchers. Um, <coughs> Research topics in uh, question answering file uh, from um, the um, 91 studies, uh, 6.72% uh, of uh, papers uh, implemented knowledge base uh, 31.94% uh, uh, implemented natural language processing. Uh, uh, fifty nine point twenty four uh, percent implemented in uh, information retrieval and uh, two point one uh, percent implemented hybrid base. Uh, data sets used uh, for uh, question answering uh, thirty five. Uh, Point ninety five percent of uh, studies are primary uh, data sets. Uh, the other data set is uh, public data sets. Since these uh, data sets are uh, not public, uh, results of uh, studies cannot be uh, compared compared with uh, result of proposed models. And uh, the poor, uh, most uh, used uh, public data set in a uh, final uh, data study uh, tracked uh, squat uh, cliff. Uh, natural uh, questions. <clears throat> methods used uh, in uh, question answering, mm, 14 methods used uh, and recommending a uh, pilot of uh, QA uh, since uh, 2000 have been determined. When the lit uh, literature uh, is examined, uh, it's seen uh, that post studies used mostly uh, classical methods such as TFIDF, PM25 in BM 25 uh, in the retrieval phrase. When we look uh, at other uh, studies, uh, one of the uh, most uh, used methods uh, is the name and the recognize NAR uh, and uh, post taking methods. Uh, it's observed uh, that such as a uh, retrieval phrase increasing text to semantic role uh, labeling with uh, these methods uh, is seen that support um, SVM is used as um, the other classical method classifier. Uh, here the category to uh, which uh, query belongs to uh, classifier uh, that uh, performance uh, document retrieval over that category. So, Semantic capture was improved uh, with SVM. Disadvantage uh, of, of uh, classical methods uh, is that a query is accessible uh, or fails to find semantical similar words. Uh, when we examined the literature, we uh, observed that learning uh, studies we have uh, increased in recent years. Years. Uh, when we examined um, studies using uh, deep learning, we see more ex that more uh, successful uh, results obtain obtained than uh, classical methods. Uh, advantages uh, of uh, deep learning is that uh, words are captured. Uh, can you hear? Uh, Dylan, sorry to interrupt you. Four minutes left. Uh, okay. Uh, the advantages of uh, deep learning is that uh, words uh, capture to its semantic uh, and um, accessible words. Uh, in this way, uh, most of uh, the studies in part of uh, question answering in recent areas on uh, deep learning. Other uh, capture uh, conclusion and future works. In the systematic literature review, uh, um, our goal uh, to analyze and summarize uh, trans data sets and uh, methods of uh, question answering uh, between 2000 and uh, from uh, 2000 to uh, 2022. Um, final studies uh, 91. 
Uh, when uh, studies uh, literature uh, are examined uh, problems in, such as uh, noise data, performance, and uh, success rates, uh, when dealt with, uh, and these problems are still among subjects uh, that open to uh, research. Analysis of uh, selected final studies uh, determined uh, that um, question answering uh, research focus on uh, four topics, knowledge uh, base, information retrieval, natural language process, keyword base. Um, and um, uh, one, uh, the studies uh, in field of question answering are excellent. Um, 14 part, uh, and uh, 14 uh, different uh, different uh, methods we used uh, question answering. Among, uh, for, among the uh, 14 methods, uh, seven uh, most applied methods determined in a uh, field of question answering. Uh, these are uh, relation finding, similar distance, uh, parsing, name at the recognized, tokenized, uh, deep learning, post technical graph. Uh, using some of these uh, techniques, uh, the uh, researchers propose some techniques to improve accuracy to uh, create wild. Thank you for um, listening. Okay. Thank you, Dion, for your presentation. <laughs> Let me ask uh, the audience if there are questions for you. He, yeah, yes, yeah. please. Uh, at least I have one question for you, Dylan. Yes. So you, from in slide nine, you define the sum ex exclu exclusion criteria. Okay. And yes. I, I'd like to know uh, why you why you define those exclu exclusion criteria, in particular the study of not written English, and uh, uh, if you are planning to include these uh, these. Uh, um, these data that are been uh, that have been excluded, and uh, how this can let's say weight uh, the, the weight of those data in 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 the in the statistical analysis. Uh, no, um, uh, yes, exclusion criteria, uh, not English uh, language uh, article, uh, but uh, I don't work uh, uh, this analysis. Okay. I don't extract. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you again, uh, Dylan. We have to move to the next uh, talk, which is from uh, yes. Mohamed Laib, from the Luxembourg Institute of uh, Science and Technology, which is here in presence. So thank you for coming, uh, Mohamed. The talk is entitled uh, Still Quality Monitoring Using Data Driven Approaches, uh, Axelor Mittal uh, Case Study. So the floor is yours. You should come here to be closer to the microphone, and uh, okay, I will tell you when uh, five minutes. So, actually, Yeah, I we should, we should what do you this want? one. We should share this one. No, I, th I don't think it's way. Uh, yes, it is. So, this one? Yes. So, yes. so, so, can I take your place? Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Just <laughs> the second that we check no. if it's a share from. Yeah, I, I can I can share in this one. Yeah. Now yes. Quality monitors, yes. Now we can okay. Okay. okay, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'm trying, I will try to, to present one of the uh, one of small part of the work that we did with uh, Arsul Mittal. It's a, 
actually the a project that uh, lasts two years and we we are trying to monitor the quality of their products so in our institute the luxembourg institute of science and technology we have several companies that comes with some research questions and we try to do some uh, uh, data driven uh, approaches to to answer to that to, the, to their questions so uh, arsenal metal data as you can see from their website they have the main quarter in luxembourg and they have uh, several products and this project actually it's uh, funded by the fnr on national de recherche in luxembourg uh, to actually to improve the quality and also to to understand the the, the the relationship between the input of their data and also the output, which is the quality. So the, the, the context that we have here, we have several steps of the production because when we are to arrive to the final product, actually we need to pass through several uh, steps and every step uh, represents here a data set. Uh, they gave us, uh, gave us only five data sets. Uh, actually, there is more than five, but they thought that it's the, the data set that's that are more important for the uh, the process production process and in each data set we recorded several parameters and these parameters i, I will explain them uh, in the presentation so the challenge that we have we have first actually uh, data that comes from multiple stages uh, we have high dimensional data because sometimes uh, in some products we have less points but a lot of uh, features uh, we have the clustered data because of as I said before, a similar project uh, product in the same time, and of course, in any as in any uh, data driven approach, the data was really not structured. And the most important point is the existence redundancy, not only in the same data set but also between the data sets. So after cleaning the data and structuring it, we finish it with uh, actually the cleaning was by the help of the experts uh, by reducing the number of features that they think that they are not uh, important in the process or, I mean, it depends on which product we are working on and also which quality we are trying to understand. Uh, so the, the, the main goal is to reduce the dimensionality more than that and to predict and monitor the quality. And more importantly, to understand analytically the relationship between the input and the quality of the final product. So we are trying to actually uh, trying to find which step can explain better the, the quality that we have at the end. So in this uh, presentation, I, I will try to explain the process of the, the manufacturing process. I'm not an expert in that, but I will try to do my best uh, later. And then I will explain the approach that we use and finally the results what, that, that we, we obtained. So when we start with the first uh, step, which is a bush, uh, first, we have data from 2018 till uh, 2020. We have three different semi products and uh, we have uh, all steel qualities. And when we say qualities here is the international standards that uh, we should follow to, to have the, uh, the, the product to, to be sell to, or to, to, to the to, to clients. And we have all the products that we can imagine from Arcelor. So for in Ebosch actually, it, there is a lot of features about the, the chemical product, or the chemical components of the of the, the product, and then we have the the, the blooming uh, step, which is uh, uh, when we when the product enters to some chamber or room to uh, to be shaped, and sometimes we have uh, several passes of the product. We and that's why the, the data is not structured, and we needed to reduce this number of passes. And in this step, we collected the force, the, the time, the temperature, and also the speed of the, the, the process for each product. Uh, the similar, similar product, uh, similar steps actually are, are tandem and finishing, who are also has the same uh, principle with the rooms and we have uh, some passes, uh, but they are all, all independent and the shape, the, actually the shape is different regarding the, with regard to the, uh, to the products we are working with. And another uh, step what that we have is the thermal treatment. And when we try to actually to cool down the, the product, and here we have the, the, uh, the pressure of water, the, the temperature, and also the speed of the cooling uh, of the product, etc. So here we are trying. So we are trying to collect all this data to, to understand the, uh, the, the quality of uh, how, how we can manage to monitor the quality through these steps. Only data-driven uh, approaches. 
and also the finishing after the thermal the, the thermal treatment we have the, the finishing which is uh, with a geometrical gauge and uh, is, is followed by a visual inspection to to check the, the quality and as i said before we have the data which is not structured and here i don't know if the i, I think i should show you the mouse yeah. So for instance, here we have uh, 16 passes, but usually it's more and sometimes it's, it's less. And we need to uh, summarize first this, these passes. Uh, here, one, when it's one, so it means that uh, the, uh, the I mean, zero and one, it's regarding the, the, the standard quality, I mean, the, the standard norm that uh, they are defined uh, by some international committee, I suppose. So we are trying to reduce these uh, passes and uh, actually, with the help of the expert, we decided to take the two last status, uh, passes. But they also said that the, the the past of the steel, the history of the steel, is very important. So we try to resume it with the uh, uh, summarize it with the mean and the standard deviation. But we can use any other techniques to to summarize this. We in this work we we use it like this. So here we have some EDA analysis about the the, the, the data set we have. As you can see, we have uh, a lot of redundancy. Uh, all the features are mostly correlated and they are grouped with, with, with regard to the, the to the type. For instance, we can find, I, I don't, I'm not allowed to show the, the names, but we can see that the, the they are related with the pressure and also with the, with the temperature. Uh, they are in the same type of features, so they are correlated, etc. And the other uh, correlation matrix you can find them on the paper. They have this similar similar structure of uh, correlation, and also an example of uh, principal component analysis to see uh, how what it looks like the, the data. So we, here we have three type three groups of uh, of features. Uh, actually, it's the some sometimes it's the shape and sometimes it's the temperature. Uh, actually, I mean the I mean the chemical the chemical component. And the, unfortunately, the uh, the PCA it will not help us to monitor the the, the quality because sometimes the the uh, the engineer need to understand which feature is is uh, is, uh, is explaining the the quality, not which combination of features. So we are trying to find, and here it's it's a more general idea about uh, the data set. Here we are trying to uh, estimate the intrinsic dimension of all data set to see which part of inform how much information we have in each data set and we can see that in Ebosch blooming we have a lot uh, more more information than in tandem but the, in, in tandem for instance we have more features so all the features are mostly redundant actually so we need to overcome this uh, problem of redundancy to uh, in order to monitor the, the quality and tell them uh, which Part of the process is uh, explaining better the, the quality. And just uh, as a comment, here we used a uh, sandbox method to estimate the ID that you can find it on our library for the fractal tools. And the, so now the, the approach that we used, we actually we did two steps uh, approach. We have a dimensionality reduction technique at the beginning, so we tried to reduce the, uh, the redundancy in each uh, data set. And then the learning part was actually sequentially uh, it's uh, sequentially with regard to the to the process so first we used a bosch with, uh, versus the output and then a bosch plus blooming i don't know if it's clear here on the slides and i'm seeing that it's not uh until the end when we put all the steps together so a bosch blooming tandem thermal treatment and finishing uh, regarding the uh, with regard to the output but just to give you a, an idea i think you already know about this uh, about the dimensionality reduction technique, we have the choice between selection or extraction. And unfortunately, as I said before, the extraction, even if it's nonlinear, it will not help us to explain the the, uh, the process to the engineer because he needs to know which features is uh, is important for him, not uh, the the combination of features. And for the so, if we go for a feature selection techniques, uh, we have the choice also between supervised and unsupervised. And in our case, we are mainly trying to reduce the redundancy so we are going to use the unsupervised feature selection when, uh, based on the space feeling design and i will explain the space feeling design so we are trying to implement this uh, i mean apply this to each data set so the, the space feeling based unsupervised feature selection as you can see we have uh, several types of uh, redundancy we have linear one and non-linear one and we need to uh, to detect the, the 
the hatch. I mean, to, to eliminate the redundant features. And uh, here we use the coverage measure, and it's a measure that's compare the uh, two. I mean, to compare features when we have redundant features, it will be a higher value, and when, when it will be uh, when we have non-redundant features, it will be, it will be a, a lower value. And we use for that the SF tool our library, so we don't need a parameter to to tune during during the selection. And we, we use the sequential forward search. Uh, there is also a uh, uh, another strategy of search you can find on GitHub. It's based on genetic algorithm with the same measure. If for those who are interested to use it, and regarding the learning part, as I, as I said before, we are more uh, we actually we want to explain the phenomena. So the prediction is not really our goal. So we are going to use more interpretable model rather than a flexible one. So we are going more with uh, random forest here in this case. So to summarize the, more the, 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 the approach, so the first part it will be the feature selection using uh, the coverage measure, and then we have uh, random forest as a classifier. And here we have the results of the feature selection. I said before that we have uh, five uh, data sets. I didn't have place in the slide that you can find on the paper, the fifth, uh, the fifth data set, if you are interested, and as you can see, we have fewer features for each data set. For instance, uh, here you are using the coverage measure and uh, we are trying to find the minimum of the coverage measure. And since it's a sequential forward search, we selected the first one, then we select the two first one, the three uh, first one, et cetera, till we find the, the minimum. And here in Eboj, for instance, we can end up with four features only, et cetera. So to summarize the number of selected features in each step, we have really fewer features uh, because of the redundancy in the in the data. As you can see, for instance, in Tondem, instead of 115, we have 15 features only selected. And now with the classification, we, we actually we try to compare by accumulating the data sets and also by using the data sets separately. So we first try to do the classification by using uh, Ebosh alone and then Blooming alone, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the, 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 black, the black curve, we are trying to accumulate with regard, of course, to the process, because the process is uh, ordered that, that way, blooming, uh, ebosh, blooming, tandem, thermal treatment, and finishing. And we can see that the, the, the quality, I mean, the performance of the, the model is obtained by, uh, by accumulating uh, from ebosh to tandem, which was actually a little bit expected by the engineers, but they needed more uh, confirmation with the, with the data. So we provide them also the, the, the feature that help to, to explain more the, the, the quality. So the take home message, uh, I hope I, I'm not, I'm in time, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Uh, good, okay. So the take home message, we try to predict the quality and monitor it in the same time because they needed to find which, step, because in manufacturing step uh, and, uh, process, there is a lot of steps and they always need which step it's, uh, explaining better the, the quality. And the approach we, we used, actually, we try to be simple because it's very, it, we try to be easy to implement and also simple to explain later. So the, the approach that we are using, it can, can be applied in other manufacturing problems or in other uh, problems that, ha that comes from, that has multiple uh, source of data. And at the end, we end up, as you can see on the paper, if you have time to, that, the, that the, the, the quality is better uh, explained by the, the tandem steps. I just have some comments about the reviewers because, uh, of course, I thank them. I didn't have the chance to, to put these comments. I just uh, corrected the paper, they, as they said. But uh, regarding the parameter of the random forest, I didn't put them because we had several models. So it was useless to put a table of the, the model. We used the k fold cross-validation to find the the optimal parameters. And regarding naming the feature and also sharing the data, unfortunately, we cannot because it's the contract with the Arsenal, uh, unfortunately. And uh, regarding the software we used, we used R and with a large panel of library, like for the cleaning, it was tidyverse. For the model, it was tidy models. And for the, uh, the feature selection, it was SF tools. And uh, yeah, for the PCA, there is a lot of uh, library for that. Okay. Thank you very much, and if you have questions, I'm here.
Aí, eu ele entrezinho, não tem é problema. É, yes, I had a couple of questions, but you answer them with the final slide. So uh, I, <laughs> I, I have another one, but first let me ask to the audience if there are questions. Okay. If not, uh, my, my question is about uh, computing requirements of your uh, proposed solution, at least applied uh, to your uh, data set. Do you need uh, special resources or just uh, trivial ones for running uh, the I, entire uh, chain? It, it depends actually uh, with the data. Sometimes we have, actually it depends on the products we are analyzing. When we analyze some products, they have a lot of data, so uh, we need more, like we are using the HPC in our uh, institute. Okay. So we can use these uh, resources, but sometimes we have not a lot of data because the product is not always produced. So we can use a uh, small laptop, but it's done. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the, the problem, the main problem is with the feature selection that we use this, this, uh, in this work. It's based on the distance matrix. And when you have a lot of points, it's painful to, to get the, the distance matrix because, because actually to compute it, we need to find the, the nearest neighbor of the point. And then we try to, to compute the uh, variational coefficient of the, of the distances. Yeah. Oh, you mean the yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No, okay. okay, so we are left with the last uh, talk for this uh, session. It is from uh, Alessandro Bombini from uh, the Italian Institute uh, of Nuclear uh, Physics, uh, the Cultural Cultural Heritage Network. The uh, the talk is entitled uh, Hyperparameter Optimization of Artificial Intelligence for Digital Restoration of Cultural Heritage Models. And Alessandro, I had a quick look at your slides. Uh, the last one is numbered uh, 108. So yeah. <laughs> remember that you have 20 minutes, including uh, question and answer. I will uh, warn you. <laughs> yeah, we warn you when uh, five minutes uh, will be left. Okay. So the stage is yours. You, we can see your screen. So let me see if I can uh, set. Yeah. It. Uh, no. Uh, one moment. One moment. I will try yeah. to put the. The slides in, uh, in, in slide in slides. Ta ta ta. Uh, again, let me try again. Okay, better, right? Yeah, yeah. Now we yes, can. Yes, perfect. Speak okay, now. thank you for the nice introduction and for the opportunity to have a talk here. Uh, I will try to be. In, in, in to stay in the 15 minutes slot. So again, I'm Alessandro Bombini from the Italian Institute of Nuclear Physics, in particular from the CHNet, the Cultural Heritage Network, where we apply the nuclear techniques to the cultural heritage uh, sector. And I will talk about our latest paper uh, about this project, ARES, and its uh, hyperparameter, hyperparameter optimization. So what is IRES? Uh, it's a tentative of try to digitally restore damage paintings uh, by employing together physics and artificial intelligence by means of uh, nuclear imaging technique, the X-ray fluorescence, and uh, a deep neural network, uh, namely, let's say, uh, convolutional neural networks like, uh, in order to pass from the XRF to a recolored image. So the idea is that uh, we will have a uh, build in the end uh, a web-based app to be offered uh, within the, our uh, software as a service cloud for the digital restoration of pictorial artworks 
the, which employs computer vision technologies uh, applied to physical imaging raw data, in particular X-ray fluorescence. The idea is having uh, uh, as an input this kind of 3D tensor, like an RGB with multiple channels in a different uh, bandwidth region, namely in the X-ray region, and pass it to a multidimensional deep neural network comprising multiple branches, a one-dimensional deep neural network uh, capable of learning how to associate RGBs to peaks distribution in the uh, histograms of the XRF pixel by pixel. So it loses spatial correlations, but it's capable of learning from millions of pixel histograms. And a 2D branch uh, that uh, as a consci, it learns from few images, but uh, is capable, is learn, it learns how to associate RGBs to regions and peak distribution, so learns spatial correlations. In the end, uh, the idea is passing these uh, results uh, to a refiner network that learns how to properly merge the two and having the final recolored image. Why, Iris, first step, why? The fact is that sometimes when uh, analyzing with nuclear techniques, uh, um, cultural heritage paintings, uh, we face multi-layered pictorial artworks that, has, uh, that have hidden older, no more visible layers due to correction, pentimenti, or even modern restoration processes. Also, we may face them as surfaces, especially in frescoes, where we have no more visible uh, pictorial layer, but uh, uh, the pigments are still detectable using nuclear techniques. And also in a different fashion, from a different approach, we, we, we can use a well-trained deep neural network that is capable of, of infer the RGB starting from this nuclear imaging raw data uh, uh, as, a, as a means to communicate something peculiar when it fails. So if it is very well-trained, uh, it's failing my signal something interest, interesting in the, in the artwork. Maybe the pigment composition is quite rare or not present in, in, the, in the training data set. But uh, crucially, it also be helpful when it's success. As an example, as a little spoiler, this is a fresco, a crocifissione di Viterbo, 16th century circa. The two branches, the 2D in the middle and the 1D in the, on the right, were capable of detecting the blue veil uh, here. But this blue veil, this is the actual RGB, the, it is a lapis lazuli blue that is usually a very difficult to characterize the pigment using these techniques, the XRF. And the fact is that the neural network was probably capable of seeing the, the, the small traces of calcium or uh, uh, potassium in the lazurite comprising the pigment. So what is X-ray fluorescence? I mean, I don't know if many of you have ever heard about it. It's uh, imaging techniques where we use uh, X-ray emission coming from an X-ray tube, whereby thermionic effect electrons are emitted by the cathode and moved by, uh, accelerated by a huge uh, voltage to the anode. And then they, those electrons emit uh, an almost uniform, uh, uh, let's say, X-ray radiation uh, in the range, let's say, 1 keV to 30, 12, 40 keV, kilo electron volts. And those uh, X-ray are emitted and uh, bombard the samples, hit a sample somewhere, where they excite uh, the electronic level, the innermost electronic levels of the atoms comprising the pigments. And then uh, after these excitations, uh, those, uh, those electrons uh, relaxes back uh, and emits uh, a characteristic uh, X-ray fluorescence emission called secondary fluorescence. And that is peculiar uh, for each kind of, uh, the, let's say, method of uh, relaxation and they're peculiar for each element. So we are capable of uh, uh, characterize the elements in the pigments. Then uh, moving the cathode X-ray tube and detector along the X and Y lines is possible to create an histogram of count of those peaks, uh, pixel by pixel. This is how we comprise uh, the, the XRF raw data. So as again, uh, here there is an example where on the middle uh, you see uh, the, the visible of a part of a 17th century uh, painting, and then uh, it's histo XRF count, uh, XRF histogram of counts in the energy and counts, integrating certain band relating uh, here at calcium, iron, lead, and mercury. It's possible to see how the segmentation, the presence of these elements are the diffused and present uh, spatially in the image. 
But why XRF fluorescence as an imaging technique? Because it's fast, sensitive, multi-elemental, as you said, as I said before, and also it's non-invasive and non-destructive, which is crucial for cultural heritage applications. Also, it can be performed with portable apparatus, so in situ, for example, in museums, and produce macro maps even of order of meters. Also, and this is the crucial aspect for me, it is able to detect signal coming from hidden pictorial layers underneath the outermost one. This is an example. Uh, you see there is only one guy here in this uh, uh, unknown, paper, unknown author uh, uh, opera. But uh, if we look at the antimony line, we see the emergence of two female figures that are not known present in the most visible layer. And finally, and crucially, it is a technique available to us. So, coming to the detail, the training data set uh, is composed by merely 62 XRF raw data that coming from several XRF analyses on multiple paintings performed at the CHNet node of Florence, the LABEC, uh, and as well as in situ analysis. For the training model, uh, for training the models for the 1D case, uh, we randomly choose 50% uh, of the pixel in the training data set. Uh, that gives uh, two millions, more than 2 million uh, couples of histogram and RGB, so the X and the Y in the training, that are, of course, divided into training, test, and validation set. For the 2D models, we randomly split uh, the 62 in 45 for training, 9 for test, and 8 for validation. Those raw data are all obtained by our custom device, uh, built, developed, and assembled by CHNet Florence. And uh, the analysis were carried out on different artwork typologies, uh, multi-layer paintings, drawings, uh, illuminated manuscript frescoes from different periods and epochs. This might be that we may have similar color coming from different pigments. So the first attempt was to first find if it's possible by designing and testing training few neural networks. For the 1D branch, we trained a set of neural networks starting from the simple dense or convolutional like uh, ResNet and Inception. And the more uh, Inception like, everyone was capable of moderately inferring the RGB. The three more, more performing one were the last uh, three, a dilated wave net, uh, a fractal net, and a custom model that is a, a slight generalization of the, the of the ResNet model. And uh, we checked the performance on the test uh, uh, set, uh, sorry, on the validation set uh, by employing various uh, computer vision standards uh, performance index, like the structural similarity index, uh, multi -scale, its multi-scale version, the peak signal to noise ratio. The results for these two models were more or less the same, but uh, slightly the, the custom model outperforms the others at least in the um, SSCM, MS, SSCM and PSNR. On a few of the validation uh, set uh, elements, uh, the, this is a visual comparison. The first on the left is the integrated XRF. Then we have the true RGB. And you may see that the three, um, the three models were more or less capable of recoloring, so associate the correct color to the XRF pixel and with a noisy factor here that lowers all the scores, but probably but the MSS On a, This is a painting from the 18th century, so it has a certain number of pigments. On a different multi-layer painting, uh, the Renaissance period, again, the results were more or less good. And here, the, um, the, the, the custom model was uh, probably the most uh, performing one. But unfortunately, on other supports like the illuminated manuscripts we have uh, very bad results and this is uh, something i have to tell you but also uh, i want to see the the, no the positive note here by seeing that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the the neural network was capable of finding uh, let's say the pentagram drawn back in the page, so in the page back. So exactly not present in the visible layer, but the XRF was capable of finding it and the neural network understood the structure, let's say, the presence of it, even if the color is not correct. So it's good because XRF effectively sees behind the outermost pictorial layer and the neural network is capable of understanding it. Now let's move to the hyperparameter optimization of it. We employed Optuna uh, to fine tune the deep neural network hyperparameters. Especially we used the, the categorically parameter space in order to build the different neural networks on different genres of layers. 
the optimization procedure was performed over the 1,000 trials and each training over 150 epochs. And uh, for the 1D branch, uh, we generalize, let's say, our custom model somehow, even if in a trivial topological setting, where the uh, Optuna model picked uh, the composition of the neural network. In the first block, it may choose the number of convolutional neural network, the kernel size and filters, and uh, even for zero. So each uh, possible combination uh, of the three parties uh, present. So either only convolutional, only one of two, and so on. The second part is formed by either a series of inception or deleted residual block. Uh, and the third part is a dense dr plus dropout uh, uh, net, um, layers. Uh, and Optuna picks the number of dense nodes, the dropout percentage, and the activation functions. The results uh, of, the of, the, of all the trials were that uh, the most performing one uh, uh, model has uh, four convolutional layers, six inception block, uh, and four couples of dropout uh, and um, dense network. Uh, with a certain uh, um, learning rate, and the, the, the binary cross entropy was 0 0.59. For the 2D branch, uh, the preliminary phase was just uh, trying to see if it's possible to use two unit like models with a VGG like shape uh, or a DLRS net like shape. And again, they were capable of inferring the RGB somehow with scores that seems to be higher with respect to the 1D, except for the multi scale SSM. And of course, the best model was always the DLRS net. But uh, when we applied uh, on the same validation uh, elements as before, uh, the 1D seems visually more appealing, uh, even though more uh, noisy. And this is why all the scores are higher for the 2D, but the multiscale sim that seems to be the best score to understand the proficiency of these models. And also, uh, on the illuminated manuscript, it's still not good the 2D, but it's better than 1D. And this is, let's say, tell us that it's right to have multi-branches. We also uh, optimize the hyperparameter for the 2D branch, starting from the DLSNet uh, model as a base. Uh, again, we have a random number of convolutional blocks uh, in the encoder-decoder part, their kernel size and number of filters chosen by Optuna, optimized by Optuna, and the number and kind of internal blocks as before, inception or deleted residual block. Unfortunately, here we face a technical issue. Uh, normally, uh, up to now, or even for the previous two decades, the training data set uh, has uh, 500 channels in energy. But uh, for uh, uh, resource handling of Optuna, it wasn't possible in a, on our hardware setup. So we have to reduce the size in memory. And we done it by integrating out uh, 26 most relevant elemental maps. Nevertheless, we know that we, this will come with an issue uh, because subdominant peaks uh, and the background usually are very important uh, in understanding the XRF image. Nevertheless, uh, Optuna picked uh, this kind uh, of, uh, of best model in these trials, in set of trials, five uh, convolutional blocks uh, and uh, six internal blocks to inception like and for the net like. We, Alessandro, sorry if, uh, to interrupt you, five minutes left. Yes, yes, I know. Thank you. Uh, it picked also the uh, learning rate and the loss was uh, surprisingly lower with respect uh, of the 1D case, 0 0.39. So the question is, it's OK, it's good to having uh, optimized using Optuna or not. For the 1D branch, actually, it seems yes. Those are uh, on the first row, uh, we have the optimized, and in the second row, the non-optimized mo best model, that is the custom multi-input. Visually, uh, it seems that the colors are better represented uh, in the optimized model on the right, while in the middle is, was the previous result I show you. And uh, the 1D optimized model outperformed the previous one in the most important score, the MSSIM, and it's in the SSIM, but not in the peak signal to noise ratio. And this may be, and this may signal that the previous non optimized model could be ca more capable of detecting rare pigment specimen. 
but from the visual perspective is better uh, the one the opt uh, optimized model and this is what MSS sim is telling us unfortunately for the 2d branch as you can see here the optimized model is way underperforming with respect uh, of the non-optimized due to the technical issue i described before so we uh, have, has found that optimizing in this case was totally useless, but it was somehow expected from XRF theory because the background and subdominant peaks uh, are crucially, as crucial in the XRF interpretation, but also implies that we can dramatically improve the optimization by improving the hardware setup. So as a recap, we have the found an, uh, an optimized 1D model that outperforms more or less every in, in every score the, the non-optimized way, while the 2D is, uh, is uh, unfortunately not successful. So to conclude, uh, we have shown that the goal of inferring RGB image from XRF raw data is feasible, and we have developed both 1D and 2D branch of the uh, full model. We have planned a new measurement campaign jointly with Biblioteca Marucelliana in Florence on their drawings to enlarge and standardize the training data set, which is a crucial step here. We have started using uh, Optuna and we have performed hyperparameter optimization and we have improved the 1D branch. Also, we have embedded uh, the alpha version of the network inside our XRF web tool for visualizing raw data in the web. And we are going to develop the technique uh, to take in account uh, uh, the presence of pictorial, hidden pictorial layers uh, uh, in order to actually digitally restore the, the, the painting, somehow factoring out the contribution from the outermost layer, the, the GANEX project. And also, as I said at the beginning, this is not the only application because failing is also interesting. And then uh, using an Internet of Things, in things approach and linking to the web the imaging instruments, especially the portable ones, we can try to have and furnish a service for real time recoloring in during acquisition. That could be interesting because it may signal uh, interesting, uh, relevant information during failing um, about, let's say, uh, a peculiar pe presence uh, of, in, of pigments of rare specimens. That's all. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Alessandro. Very interesting questions to Alessandro. Okay, if not, I have a very quick one. Uh, maybe it's just a detail, but in your slide uh, 19, uh, 18, sorry, you say that uh, this procedure can be performed with the portable apparatus for in situ analysis. Yes, yes. Exactly this one. You mean uh, for the X-ray apparatus, or uh, you mean for the computing system to analyze the data, the portable uh, apparatus? Actually, both. But here, I mean the the portable apparatus one. This on the top, on the bottom right, you may see the apparatus here. Uh, this side is, let's say, sixty centimeters. So it few kilos, and is usually port uh, moved uh, into museums or for example for frescoes you cannot move frescoes of course you move the apparatus and uh, everything is uh, managed by a single person somehow so it's totally uh, movable okay uh, so okay and also for the computer part at least for the inference part it can be done in situ on the archaeological site on the museum yeah um, we are discussing about because uh, if the if, uh, usually this xrf machine okay let's say is connected to a computer the key issue may be during in situ analysis having the connection for the remote computer but nevertheless any laptop has the enough computing uh, resources to uh, run uh, the prediction phase of the model so it, it is not an issue per se it's the training part that may be uh, hardware consuming okay. yeah yeah sure Okay, thank you, Alessandro. Thank okay. you for There are no other uh, questions. So this uh, concludes the workshop. Thank you everybody for attending and uh, uh, presenting uh, all these uh, valuable uh, uh, presentations uh, and uh, papers. So thank you again and see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.
Who is the the, the chair? Thank you. So good afternoon everyone. Um, we will start with the second part of our session that is called Building Multidimensional Model for Assessing Complex Environmental Systems. Uh, today in the second part, uh, I'm the chair with uh, Julia Dattora. Uh, uh, I don't want to spend much time on other things, so we will start with the first presentation. The author is Federico Dell'Anna, with a contribution entitled Spatial Econometric Analysis of Multifamily Housing Prices in Turin, the Heterogeneity of Preferences for Energy Efficiency. So the floor is Where's the device? Is it just uploaded? If you go to the pizza, uh, the first one. Okay, a minute, please. Mm -hmm. This one? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a first one. That's a... So, we go here and. Okay. Buenas dias and good morning to all. Uh, today, I will share with you an research in which uh, I investigated the preferences for energy efficiency, starting from uh, the real estate price of multi-family building in Turin. In particular, I used the spatial econometric model in order to identify the relationship between the price and the different characteristics of the of the house, like uh, intrinsic intrinsic and extrinsic uh, features. Um, the presentation is uh, structured as follows: after an introduction of the context, uh, I will present the objectives of the study, the methods used, the application to a real case study, and the. Uh, Make results in the final uh, We know very well that there are a uh, lot of directives, European directives, that support the energy transition of the built environment. And in particular, the last one, important, is the, are the national building renovation plans based on. Uh, the uh, resilience uh, and the recovery plans uh, after the COVID-19. And uh, the process of uh, this big uh, renovation wave started uh, in uh, 2002 with the first uh, European Building Performance Directive that proposed uh, the introduction of the energy performance certificate, which is the performance, the energy performance certificate is uh, an index that uh, describes the energy performance of appliances and also of house. And uh, it is mandatory for all of the member states to, to inform the consumers about this uh, uh, performance of uh, this. Uh, uh, in this context, it becomes important to understand the consumer's behavior in order to align the different policy that uh, can be implemented also at the local level for the uh, promoting the energy efficiency. In particular, in this study, I focus on the uh, building sector, in particular, the private and residential building. Okay, 
uh, there are a lot of studies about this uh, issue, in particular in uh, Europe, that investigate uh, the influence of uh, energy performance certificate on audit pricing. But uh, uh, the most used uh, approach is uh, the hedonic pricing method that uh, uses a fixed uh, um, variable in order to describe the parcelization of, uh, the, of the building and uh, never uh, the interaction between uh, the building characteristics and the localization are, uh, are, are studies. Only uh, in 2020, McCord uh, proposed the, the application of the geographically graded regression model in order to investigate the iteration of the uh, building age and the, the energy performance certificate. Uh, this study is basically is based on the uh, research question of the MECCORD and colleague studies in order to test this interaction in three. In particular, the, the aim is to provide maps in order to, to represent in a simple, uh, simple way the information that could help the public authority, for example, or private investor, in order to uh, increase uh, the awareness for energy efficiency and uh, increase also the, the sale, the transaction of energy efficiency gain. Uh, the hedonic price method is uh, was proposed the first uh, time in uh, by Rosen in 1974, and uh, it is uh, commonly used for the estimation of uh, the influence of the different characteristics of the house, the price, but also for, for the, the amenities. Uh, environmental amenities, human amenities. The basic uh, 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 mathematical assumption is the use of uh, the ordinary least square in order to provide the relation to find the relationship between the price, that is the dependent variable, and the, the independent variable, like uh, the, all the characteristics that uh, can be considered in the, in the study. But uh, in the, these last years, uh, uh, the hedonic price method was integrated also with the uh, geographic information system in order to provide uh, more efficient uh, model in order to analyze the effects uh, in space uh, or the relationship in the space. Um, uh, in order to provide uh, the possibility to, to develop spatial relation. In particular, uh, are two the main issue that are um, uh, faced by spatial relation. The first one is the spatial dependence, and the second one is the spatial heterogeneity. In these uh, studies, uh, I focus in particular on the spatial heterogeneity, because the aim is to investigate all the, how the relationship between the dependent variable and independent, independent variables uh, vary in the space. Uh, compared to the traditional model based on a uh, uh, method, the way uh, the graphical and weighted regression are based on uh, a set or local, local linear model based on uh, um, a bandwidth in order to define a characterization of the different observations in the space. Um, in order to investigate the, the influence of energy performance certificate in green. Uh, the, uh, the, first, uh, the first step uh, includes the collection of the data to be used for the devel development of the, of the studies. 
uh, for this application, uh, I collected uh, almost uh, uh, 6,000 uh, observations from uh, 2014, uh, from 2014 to 2021, an error uh, of apartments in multiple buildings in this people. We have, uh, I have uh, also selected a, a set of variables in order to develop the model, in particular the, the, search, the open price in uh, the constitute uh, uh, our data uh, variable and other structural characteristics like upgrades, uh, floor level, maintenance status, market segment, the ATC level. The car park in Other uh, characteristics uh, are related to the construction period. In particular, we use uh, a set of dummy variables in order to describe this uh, picture of the building uh, stock and alive. And uh, then, yeah, there is another information that is uh, the, the years of the advertisement. Of the of their part. Uh, naturally, uh, we are also uh, coordinate geographical coordinates in order to, to specialize the observation uh, in the space and uh, develop uh, uh, spatial regression uh, model. The first classification of uh, the data sets is based on the on the uh, ABC. In particular, we specialize the uh, observation and we identify the square, the different uh, uh, energy class, uh, R and the density. And uh, we saw that uh, the, the most efficiency building has a spread in overall density, but in particular in the supports. So, um, let's uh, uh, Two cases are present in the center of the city, most are in the peripheral of the area. Another information is related to the wheat properties, and we found that uh, only about 10% of the wheat in stock uh, present in the data set uh, was uh, a bit after the So it means that the, the, the wheat is not really very old. The first model of it, uh, I developed is to use the global model based on the ordinary distance square, and uh, uh, we use the semi log model where the dependent variable is the logarithm, the natural logarithm of the variable in the price, while the, uh, the independent variable are in the uh, original scale. From this model, we found that the there is uh, an appreciation for the high level of energy performance directive where the, the efficiency uh, obtained a positive uh, uh, sign. And uh, uh, compared to the newest uh, reading, we found that the, the basically the, the reading with before uh, 90 is uh, uh, more uh, appreciated compared to the other one because it's the uh, uh, only one that obtained uh, a positive condition in terms of the uh, age of the of the people. Another issue that uh, is present in these studies is the interaction. Following the studies of X for the X, and uh, uh, we seek, I simply multiply the, uh, the variable related to the age with the curves. So, in this model, in this uh, uh, way, we can uh, uh, understand if there is an appreciation for high level uh, of energy in relation to the age of uh, bills. For the different uh, 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 how to do the data. 
And uh, from this uh, uh, model, we identify that uh, there the exists only a one preference for within a uh, building with uh, before 90 and uh, between 91 and 95, while uh, the other ones are uh, have uh, uh, very little impacts. Uh, but uh, the results are not close um, After the local mo the global model, based on all the square, I also go to local model, based on geography, 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 and weight propagation. And uh, in this case, uh, we identify that uh, the Energy performance certificate application is very uh, exists in the most part of the, of the city, while also the minimum value uh, is negative, while the first part is uh, positive, and uh, uh, while for the construction period, uh, uh, we can identify that. Uh, the most of the uh, more appreciated uh, age is uh, the, the first, while uh, the other one uh, maintain uh, the negative value of uh, until the uh, first uh, value. As I said before, uh, the geographical integrated derivation allows also to specialize results. And uh, in this map, I specialize the coefficients measured for the uh, energy performance certificate. And uh, we found that uh, there is, uh, in general, uh, a positive uh, impacts of energy level, uh, energy class level, in particular in uh, this part of the city. This is uh, uh, the central value of the neighborhood and in the planetary area. While uh, the, the appreciation for an energy performance certificate doesn't exist in the, in the center of the city. Where we can see this uh, uh, dark blue uh, forms. And this is, uh, could be very obviously because the obvious because uh, in particular the city center, the appreciation is for other characteristics like uh, architectural, historical characteristics. This is the model that we. Uh, in this model, uh, we, uh, I have um, investigated also the interaction when the geographical interpretation model. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, I found that uh, the uh, appreciation exists uh, for uh, most of the leading age because uh, the positive signs are. On the first part here, and uh, uh, for the second, for this uh, two different uh, age, this means that uh, in Turin, uh, the appreciation for uh, the energy performance certificate, uh, high level of energy performance, uh, performance certificate is very higher in all the cities, confirming the results that we found uh, before with the global one. But uh, uh, thanks to uh, this model, uh, we also uh, specialize the results uh, in order uh, to define uh, area in which uh, the area in which uh, the energy performance activity is not so uh, high appreciated. And uh, this max can help, for example, the public authority to provide the specific. Uh, Financing tool, for example, for a specific area of the city, where, for example, we have uh, some problem of social economical, some problem. In fact, focusing on the first map that is related to the first uh, construction period, the older one, uh, we found that uh, the most negative impacts uh, are in two neighborhoods. We have to include them. And uh, uh, Madonna di Campania. 
that are uh, uh, very difficult um, uh, neighborhood in terms of social economic impact. Um, so, uh, from uh, in these studies, uh, we estimated the local effects of structural characteristics, such as the energy performance certificate, uh, starting from the property price of multifamily homes in green. We estimated the uh, in particular low elevation using the geograph geographical determination model, and uh, uh, we and the results are satisfactory. So this means that this model can help in order to define the effects in the, the relationship in the in the in the space. Um, like uh, future perspective, um, I would like to include additional variables, in particular uh, um, because, uh, a variable that you consider the energy performance index in terms of kilowatt hour, which is uh, a, a scale variable compared to the energy performance certificate that is a level one. In, uh, Using a continuous variable it could be better in order to describe better the relationship between, between the energy performance and the dependent variable related to the price. Uh, you would like also to include the extrinsic variable because we know that the urban amenities, urban infrastructure, the infrastructure, transportation uh, means uh, are a very important uh, uh, variable in the definition of the price and uh, could be interesting to understand uh, if uh, the preference of energy performance uh, certificate uh, has changed in the time so it could be interesting to, to identify if the trends of consumers preferences uh, was uh, uh, influenced uh, by specific policy, maybe, maybe that uh, have been implemented during the, this year that uh, I have analyzed in this uh, study. So thank you for your attention. Counter intuitive that uh, in the historic center that the EPC, not only that it had no effect on the value of the properties, but perhaps we even lose discount. So that's yeah. very counterintuitive. Uh, was the discount, was it statistically significant? And I'll answer. Yeah. <laughs> was the discount statistically Okay, um, in a geographical regression model, uh, it's very difficult to identify the variable level But from the experience uh, and uh, from other studies, uh, it, the results uh, seem to uh, be uh, correct. Could be interesting, for example, to uh, interview some geographical uh, datums. In order to understand if uh, the results are, it could be a future step also for the research. I just also, wonder why this, this would be present, what would drive this? I don't suggest maybe there's some bad energy efficiency retro, retrofits bringing down historical value, which you are going to bring up. Otherwise, it brings up the price. Maybe if you don't so the variable the model to uh, then define if uh, each uh, aspect are uh, considered by the function. And uh, for sure, uh, I think the, the also the socioeconomic aspect uh, would be interesting for if it is interesting to comment to the results to discuss the results for sure. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Sure, we you. Uh, it's like a stack swan. I was trying to okay. get the, the streaming. Sorry. Oh. So we can pass to you.
to the next competition proposed by Vanessa Suma, Carlo Pagliolo, and Apolino and the Giulio C, entitled the issue of an integrated theoretical framework to assess the LPS sustainability in flow with IA. So I need to call you Vanessa and Carlo. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
to support decision and policy makers in the assessment uh, of complex spatial uh, systems affected by flood risk and uh, try to define the prioritization of uh, intervention and adaptation. And more uh, specifically, um, that uh, method uh, trying to combine um, inverse modeling and uh, multi-criteria decision analysis uh, techniques, um, trying to assess uh, the uh, climate adaptation uh, solutions, and due um, uh, to the implementation of nature-based solutions and trying also to uh, evaluate uh, the different scenarios. Starting from the, the first part of this methodology, um, we developed a spatially integrated evaluation method uh, by combining the IMES tool um, and GIS uh, tools. Uh, the IMES software um, is uh, Means integrated evaluation of ecosystem services and trade-off, and is a software developed by the Natural Capital Project, and uh, it works with uh, spatial uh, data. Uh, so the elaboration of the, the, the input and output uh, uh, of the modeling uh, are uh, uh, spatially efficient. And uh, more specifically, we use the urban flood risk mitigation model that's basically trying to solve the empirical, empirical representation of the hydrological aspects for estimating the of production and the relation ability of cities in the face of uh, extreme rainfall. So I'm okay. leaving the floor to my colleague. Thank you, Carlotta. Now we can uh, go uh, to toward the second part of this theoretical framework that is represented by NCDA techniques, particularly according to the results that we have obtained in the previous publication, at least in the press, we have uh, extended the, uh, the proposed method that was the uh, AWOT uh, analysis according to a dynamic uh, approach. This extension is due to the fact that we uh, have to deal with uh, complex problems that arise by several interdependencies that are, that are typical of the socio-ecological systems. Uh, since the AHP process is uh, um, characterized by hierarchical structure and uh, allows to um, make a decision problem simple for decision makers, uh, in this way, we uh, don't, don't renounce to the complexity of the decisional problem because uh, we maintain the network approach thanks to this uh, uh, dynamic extension. The dynamic SWOT analysis was uh, um, theorized by an uh, Italian professor, it is uh, Betsy, in the early 2000s, and it uh, has been characterized over time by several extensions. And this one is a novel uh, proposal that we want to um, uh, consolidate in the uh, relevant literature. Uh, by the way, uh, the main steps of the, this method is characterized, of course, by a knowledge analysis that can be performed through, uh, for example, GIS methods or the consultation of existing plans, programs, or projects, or database. Then, uh, once having collected a deep uh, knowledge framework, it is possible to develop the conventional sort analysis, and so it can be developed with the traditional four quadrants uh, uh, metrics or, for example, by creating the uh, steep analysis, uh, the acronyms of the society, technology, economy, environment, and policy, for example. Then uh, there is uh, the integration with uh, the uh, NCDA technique. In our case, it's the LHP, the analytic year process. And uh, according to our uh, decisional problem under investigation, we identify as goal criteria, sub criteria, and alternatives the elements that are close to the climate adaptation and natural based solutions. So, for example, for the goal can be the finding of the optimal to solve the decision problem, in this case, the identification of the best NPS solution. The criteria can be derived directly from the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats of our case study. 
the sub criteria it could be extracted according to the knowledge analysis that can be represented by general indicators but also site specific indicators that can better represent the territory under investigation and the alternatives can be for example the uh, asset of a natural based solution or alternative that can respond to um, Ready to, to respond to the climate change adaptation. About uh, yes, what concerns the evaluation for, it is very important to select a panel of multidisciplinary experts because we are dealing with a complex problem characterized by interdependencies. And so it is important to consider, for example, uh, specialist experts with uh, expertise. Uh, Society, cultural heritage, or each dimension that could be directly involved in uh, climate change adaptation. Then uh, it is possible to uh, develop within the survey um, a questionnaire, a focus group, an interview face to face, and using uh, the uh, weighting approach in order to identify, the, uh, to know the relevance of the several elements of our um, hierarchical problem according to uh, our evaluation model and using the SATI scale. Then it is possible to determine the local priorities. Uh, in this case, uh, softwares like expert choice, expert decision can help uh, the evaluator, the analyst, the, the researcher uh, to derive directly the local and global priorities through the eigenvalue formula and other statistical formula and uh, obtain uh, the ranking of the alternative scenarios. Of course, uh, for whatever uh, evaluation model, it is very important to perform a sensitivity analysis in order to check the robustness of our decisional problem. For example, the one at a time approach is a very good uh, approach to test its uh, robustness. Um, just to... Uh, move uh, in the previous slide because I forgot to say that uh, the, dynamic work, the, the dynamic approach that integrates the SWOT analysis uh, it, it is represented from a practical point of view with a grid where each element of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats are codified and imported within an Excel matrix and each element interacts with each other Okay. And each, in each cell, it is possible to attribute a score, quality quantitative score, if we want, for example, to use the semaphorical classes of value or a um, uh, numerical scale from uh, very low to very, very high, the minus three to plus three, for example. In this case, uh, labeling, for example, the synergy between uh, a couple of elements or if the elements are going to contrast each other. Uh, at the end, once we uh, can fill uh, the overall matrix, uh, it is possible to deliver the dependent and the independent variables. And uh, these scores can help also the selecting of the indicators that uh, will populate our hierarchy tree. And now we can see the overall theoretical proposal. And so, in order to know the functioning of this, uh, of the integration between uh, the index modeling and the dynamic uh, hours analysis. Um, we start with uh, the index modeling, so the several elaborations. And in the example phase, it is developed the parameter with the multi-criteria decision analysis is uh, as a bridge between the example and the, the itinerary phases. The outputs derived from from the IPES modeling the, and uh, the multi-criteria decision analysis uh, helps uh, to obtain a final outcome that is uh, characterized by the assessment of the most critical and the scenario, for example. The assessment of the effect that the, um, the NBS scenario can produce on the environment and its components and uh, as the decision makers to define uh, uh, actions of mitigation and uh, environmental compensations. Um, moving, uh, moving toward the conclusion, uh, is, um, according to the um, results obtained in the previous work and the 
theoretization of this framework, then we are able to identify uh, a set of uh, positive aspects and negative aspects. Generally, this integrated method um, can help with the, the assessment of the best NBS uh, adaptation scenarios in order to respond, for example, to the trivial risk. About the pros, uh, inverse modeling can provide a way of physical and ecological evaluation. Uh, the our model uh, once uh, is it, uh, is once uh, in, identified and calculated the set of indicators at the state of the art, uh, assessed the importance and prioritized the scenarios, uh, can of course help the decision makers toward a shared vision of the problem and of its resolution. The integration between the two uh, methods uh, it is possible also with specific parameters, and in our case, either runoff run retention, okay, and of course, uh, this integration could be uh, further refined uh, in um, future uh, applications. But we have also identified some li limitations, for example, uh, the difficulty of the dynamic award analysis to evaluate the influence relationships between numerous elements. So it's very important in the knowledge analysis to well select a reasonable number of elements, otherwise it, can, it will complicate the, the evaluation process. Okay. Uh, the current model doesn't permit the interdependencies assessment of complex spatial systems, so it, it is uh, important to have uh, um, a set of applications in order to consolidate uh, the, the overall and general assessment. Okay? Uh, and the invest modeling synthesizes the agrogeological urban aspects through a simple method. About the future perspectives, uh, we uh, believe that the, the size of the dynamic award analysis it could be uh, further supported by uh, geospatial methods because it can uh, identify the most valuable but also the, the most critical areas and does better localize the NBS, the most um, suitable NBS scenario. Uh, the invest in the integration of bio biophysical flood assessment with the economic estimation of flood damages can uh, calculate the NBS cost benefit analysis. Uh, it will be further explored in uh, the future. We hope also with our colleagues, Julian uh, and Caterina, especially them, uh, with the integration of the dynamic modeling, for example, the system dynamics models, but also agent phase. Uh, modeling or parallel models to predict uh, particularly the potential evolution scenarios and tackle the climate change effects with uh, socioeconomic variables and uh, impacts, positive or negative, that can cause uh, a loss as well as possible benefits delivered by NBS solutions. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Vanessa and Carlotta, for your interesting contribution. Uh, any question? I have a little bit of a question. Thank you for the presentation. It was quite interesting. From what I understand, you in this uh, presentation, you are theoretizing the, the approach which was presented earlier as a sort of case study. Yes. And my question first is, so what was the scale of the case study? Since I'm not sure if I'm trying yeah, to yeah. adjust it somewhere. Thank you very much. In fact, we, uh, we uh, have presented it in a general way the case study because we have not so much time. Uh, by the way, uh, the man and biosphere area it, it consists of uh, uh, a numerous uh, set of municipalities in the, metro in the metropolitan area of Turin. But for this first application, we have considered the main city, Turin, and some um, boundaring municipalities. And we have chosen the uh, municipalities according to the data availability, especially for the climate change adaptation part, because uh, we have um, uh, the data availability on the website of the Environmental Regional Agency for uh, monitoring stations that are localized in specific municipalities. 
and so we have uh, approached for the first time according to this uh, municipalities selection. Uh, by the way, we would extend uh, from a practical point of view the application to the wall map of UNESCO because it is uh, constituted by the core areas that express the outstanding value. Then there are the transition area where are included other municipalities and the buffer area. And so it, we have uh, a lot of work. <laughs> Okay, okay. I, I want this to. This is my question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, about the uh, dynamic SWOT analysis, uh, it is applied to the whole uh, case study. So it's not referred to each uh, municipality, but it, it, it is develop, developed by considering the um, selected set of um, the selected cluster of municipalities. And so we have performed the GIS analysis by considering, for example, the cultural heritage, the flood, the presence of the flood areas or landslides, or even um, the presence of protected areas. And then, according to all these informations and also the consultation of the municipal plans, we have populated a general SWOT analysis. Oh. Exactly. Then we have. Um, since uh, the several elements uh, about the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats can refer to different dimensions of the socio ecological system, we have codified each strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and we have moved this information in a um, grid matrix, okay, where we have evaluated per wise uh, the influence of an element on another. For yeah, but, but my question was, uh, Based on what? Okay, the, the motivation is the fact that uh, systems are ever more complex and uncertain. But the decision makers need a simple in need of a simple evaluation methods. And according to our experience, also as a research group, uh, we have noted that the AHP analytic hierarchy process is more appreciated than the network models because it allows to have less pairwise comparison than, for example, the analytic network process or other fine network models. And if we want to apply this method in a real decisional problem, we have also to consider the real-time process yeah, and yeah, also that the availability yeah, and also the availability of the experts. So when we are, you are in front of a large number of pairwise comparison, uh, you can risk to have a half evaluation from the specialist because he or she can complain about the numerous pairwise comparison, but the AHP can help you to have a more sim a simplification of the decisional problem, but the dynamic SWOT analysis allow you to not renounce to the investigation of the network of the interdependencies within the socio-ecological system and it is performed by the evaluator or the researcher. This is a part related to the research. However, uh, in the meanwhile, when yeah. I am asking to you, uh, a future perspective can be in the moment uh, in that we want to integrate the, this model with the GIS, we can wait, for example, the uh, experts answers uh, and so you produce some sort yeah. of yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. this is going to be a <laughs> thank you very much thank you so we can have a okay so thank you for this interesting uh, discussion about this contribution thank you so we can 
So we can uh, conclude this uh, session building a uh, multidimensional model for assessing complex environmental systems. So first of all, I would just thank all uh, the, the contribution and of course the authors. about the multidimensional problems and of course to put the attention on different evaluation methods both qualitative and quantitative touching different topics from the energetic from the uh, real estate evaluation resilience and social and impacts and uh, other dimensions so uh, and uh, moreover i want to thank my colleague Caterina Capriori, Vanessa Summa, Federico Dellana and also uh, Marco Velo that is uh, online to have uh, coordinated together this uh, session so i would like to invite uh, 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 Mango Zotta Anzi to uh, introduce the other session in form and to illustrate her contribution. Thank you. So, uh, in my presentation, I, which, by the way, belongs to this another workshop, which uh, actually we had four submissions in the beginning, but after it ended up with mine. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's why I'm here. Uh, well, and uh, in this, uh, and it was joined to yours, <laughs> which is my great pleasure to meet you. Guys. So, uh, in this uh, presentation, I'd like to focus on, actually, I'd like to present the assumptions of the study, which uh, we are sort of slowly uh, starting in, in our university, which refers to the problem which is actually quite pertinent uh, of modernist housing estates, which in Poland, they, uh, well, accommodate a lot of people and they need to be uh, sort of, uh, dealt with in order to, to somehow adjust to contemporary living conditions. Uh, therefore, uh, in this presentation, I will start with a brief uh, introduction to whatever me livability and urban health mean, which is very broad and I could talk for hours, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, ...behind modernist housing estates, since there is quite obvious overlap between the two, uh, perspectives, but uh, it occurs that uh, there are also some uh, differences. Then I would like to briefly show you the case study uh, of two housing estates uh, which are in my city and uh, finally analyze the features of urban form and come to some observations and conclusions which hopefully in future will lead to, uh, to, to some uh, more developed uh, methodology using also GIS. This is like sort of so, uh, as I said, the ability is a concept which has got multiple meanings. It was started being developed in the 50s in, in the Netherlands. Afterwards, it spread out and uh, became extremely popular. Uh, from well, the review of, uh, of of research on this topic, which is quite abundant. Uh, well, this was another paper written with my colleague from. Uh, University of Technology, uh, we uh, picked up uh, a number of factors which uh, relate directly to public space. So not uh, everything, not the quality of uh, apartments, not the quality of buildings, not energy efficiency, which is of course very important and uh, we are not neglecting that, uh, nor not uh, flood resilience, although this is also quite interesting and, and related. But specifically, the, uh, the qualities of public space in between buildings, since uh, this is quite interesting actually, because uh, modernist housing estates, due to its uh, well, different organization, uh, due to the disruption, 
Uh, well, they, uh, for instance, it's quite complicated to use to, to, to apply the configurational methods like space parts uh, there. So it doesn't really work in such environments. Uh, yeah. So uh, one of the most important elements next to these, which are listed here, such as access to public transport, mobility, access to multiple forms uh, of recreational facilities is the role of greenery and uh, this is also this element which overlaps with the assumptions of modernist uh, design uh, as we all know okay. uh, and uh, here the view of recent research on the relationship between urban health and uh, exactly infrastructure and not only the, the good variant forces and forces and, and others uh, uh, which provides a sort of review and, and some other sources we also look at. Uh, uh, we distinguished uh, several conditions for greenery which uh, works well and really it might uh, sort of play a major role in urban health for people in here to, to enjoy the reality. And uh, so first there are these aspects of access and this access what is also quite interesting uh, numerous research proof, of course, that physical access is necessary. In, in some of these, there are uh, some uh, quantitative data, what should be the distances, what should be the sizes of these uh, in spaces in order to really count. But it's not just that, because, for instance, some research on health also confirms that visual access to vegetation improves our well-being, especially psychological aspects. And this was, uh, for instance, confirmed by patients recovery time in hospitals. Uh, other things which are important for the conditions of greenery is the connectivity. So, so whether these green areas are connected to each other. Uh, there is a variety of forms of green spaces. And here they are uh, sort of, uh, again, listed. Uh, uh, and, and finally, uh, other special qualities like safety from traffic, suitability for young children, for elderly, this is also the presence of these facilities which, which might serve these groups. Uh, of course, also benefits defined in the linear ecosystem services framework, but this I'm not going to talk about because it's another encyclopedia. Which... So, so, this modernist disruption of freestanding buildings in, in open space. And what happens in this uh, open space? Well, again, I, I, if you are interested in my very brief summary of what happened during modernism with greenery and, uh, and what are the most important like, milestones in development of, of modernism with regard to public space, especially, you're welcome to read the paper. I'm not going to talk about this because it's a lot of lecture. So, uh, so just, just, to, just to summarize, uh, basically, uh, as we again know, all know, the Athens Charter uh, uh, listed a number of principles, including the integration of green spaces, it was uh, yes. uh, including the housing conditions of the masses who are This it was needed at the time. Green spaces to separate functional zones to, to reduce the negative impact of conflicting activities. And functional zoning. Uh, with residential structures really distributed, freeing the land for this open space. Well, uh, these assumptions, they became very popular everywhere, yeah, and in Eastern Europe especially, due to the really problems we had there. Uh, there were several other concepts which also affected our construction sites. Uh, such as, uh, for instance, the plan for Helsinki by Sarinen, which was afterwards adapted in some solutions in the plan for Moscow, which made it very popular in this part of Europe. Uh, and, and this way, the Siam ideas uh, sort of uh, spread out. Uh, well, uh, however, at the same time, in, in our country, we have a very strong tradition of so-called so uh, social neighborhood, which, which was uh, a, well, a sort of uh, concept which uh, was derived from the uh, Paris uh, neighborhood unit, but it evolved in such a way that uh, the need for all the necessary 
let's say, public services was stressed in the proximity. And, uh, and uh, in early design, this, uh, this uh, development of thinking and a number of very valuable projects uh, uh, were built. Uh, however, uh, well, later on, uh, this uh, early approach uh, sort of uh, was, was sort of transformed. Uh, and uh, especially starting from 70s, uh, uh, due to the already quite uh, well developed prefabrication, uh, the government, I'm simplifying of course here, uh, decided to really build in, in a large scale in, uh, I think, for this day and after they are like 10, 10 times larger or 20 times larger, which meant that designers were supposed to, to switch from small, like 10 buildings, to 100 buildings and, and design it in, in, in a rapid way. Uh, well, this of course uh, posed some problems uh, and uh, it raised uh, critics. Uh, these critics uh, referred to first, there is of course a lot of green spaces, but uh, there is a group of early critics, but they are often not in human scale, they are not properly zoned, there are not, uh, nobody knows uh, who, which part of this space belongs to whom. Uh, all these are is problematic. Um, this lack of organization was also criticized from the scratch. Uh, what's more, and uh, this was also confirmed in, in this current research and by hope in future research, uh, there was lack of context for social activities, both in terms of facilities but also in terms of meaning. This has to do more to create this space in some of these. Uh, well, another another problem which uh, which uh, also appeared was related to to the lack of money and uh, the economic reasons which constrains implementation of uh, fully designed proposals. So, uh, well, the, the example which I've shown here is a good one of, of one of these uh, social neighborhoods, which was, by the way, uh, presented in, in one of these young know, congresses. And the second one, I think. On, on minimum housing. Uh, in this current research, to present the general framework, let's go to methodology. Uh, what I did, so first uh, I, I did very preliminary quantitative analysis, which was yet preceded by the typology, not just of green spaces, but also of building typology. This is especially important for the case study, which I'm going to tell you about. Uh, since uh, it's not green side, green field where this uh, housing is taken. Uh, besides, it was uh, supplemented by analysis of accessibility, so, so there were some measurements done for, for the distances between the green spaces uh, and, and the possibility to access public transportation. Uh, and the last, uh, well, the last element, uh, it was very strong focus in this research on uh, the analysis of activities. So basically, in the objective of this research to compare the framework, the physical structure which exists, with what can happen there, how people might use these spaces, how they use them now, and what, what are the opportunities for the future. Uh, therefore, looking at the study of young girl who divides activities into necessary of optional and social and says that uh, in order for optional activities to happen the environment should be appropriate. Uh, I uh, first uh, looked at the activities which really take place and, and looked at the potentials for new activities to, to, to happen in these places. Uh, in order to, 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 to look at this potential more, uh, I went back a bit to, to, the, to the beginnings of, uh, of what Hillier uh, and Hanson uh, did for the development of space impact methodology. Uh, specifically, uh, they did something that they called interface map, where they analyzed the entrances to properties and, and looked at how people can use space, what are the potentials to move around. And uh, I, I am convinced that this is sort of 
uh, way of using space which uh, actually overlaps with this uh, necessary uh, usage because uh, there we can really go because we need to enter our property. This is mandatory. We can't skip that. So, uh, well, now I will go briefly through that. The presentation of case study. We talk here about Bauti district, which uh, we started uh, well in the 19th century. Uh, this is the limitation of the whole uh, study, which which will be conducted later on. Uh, for now, from all these southern states which are located there, we are looking at the number 10 and 9. Uh, and uh, this was the map before World War II, as you see, it was in the green field. Uh, and here we have got the clear ground uh, overlapped of, uh, of these two estates. It was uh, to, to, to complete the picture, it was the, the Nazi ghetto during World War II, partially, which uh, worsened the situation. And this condition made the government uh, after World War II. Uh, to, to start the development of this site, since not only the initial structures were already deteriorated, but after well, being part of that, or the, we haven't got any uprising, but still uh, it, it needed some sort of intervention. So, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, economic reasons made uh, the government at the time decide that. Uh, the previous structures are not demolished, so they were left uh, to sort of accompany the new, new structures. Uh, well, so in the, the initial uh, project uh, consisted of six housing estates, but I'm not going to talk about them too much. Uh, we are going to focus on the two which uh, come from the uh, 80s, uh, which represent very massive structures. Here is the map of all the housing estates in the town. Uh, I will briefly go through the uh, like historical development uh, of, of these first structures right after the war. As you see, they are quite small scale. And uh, the, in this first design, there was still perimeter blocks after it evolved into more uh, sort of modernist uh, uh, design. Here there are yet still early structures. And, uh, and this the two which I'd like to talk about uh, are, are presented here. Those are two states in Plans and Sessana, with mostly blocks of flats uh, of uh, 11 or 5 floors. Uh, in in Flaska, they are slightly of different uh, different uh, heights, and as you see in the accompanying photographs, this is something uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite massive. Uh, later on, there were a uh, few more. There are also works going on in the in in this district right now. Uh, so uh, going into the technologies of the pre study. Uh, what is uh, really specific for this site is the presence of all these, which I can show you. Yeah. Yeah. Is the presence of all these gray color, which covers the historical structures. So it was quite difficult to build new buildings there. And uh, the space which uh, is uh, the outcome uh, is sort of like on the right, you have got some, some basic data. As you see, these uh, housing estates are massive. The one was intended for 9,000 people, the other for 8,000 people. So it is quite a lot. Uh, as I said, I uh, calculated the basic parameters of floor area ratio, the building coverage ratio, which uh, the results are not uh, very revolutionary since, uh, quite obviously, in modernist housing estates, we have got more open space. Uh, and uh, then in the historical uh, pieces, uh, and uh, the floor area ratio is quite similar. Um, what is uh, in the next step? Uh, what was done was the analysis of typologies of open spaces, looking at how they look and uh, how they function. In the current drawing, you see that uh, while greener is quite 
the panda in this area, there's a lot. Uh, what is marked here with this yellowish color, this is isolating reasons. So if this is overwhelming with cars, it's basically, well, it's hard to use it for recreation because, for instance, if, if children are under, they can, it, it's not very safe. Uh, of course, they provide some visual qualities, but they are either uh, in places which are noisy or polluted or it's not perceived as safe. Contrary, the places which are marked with darker uh, blue, uh, they really play as social sites. So people are sitting there, chatting, uh, hanging around. There are a few photographs here showing that, so you might learn what I mean saying that. So talking about the creation playground, this is such a cozy place in the developing block where people are really hanging around, spending time. Why this isolation of parking is empty here? It's, it's, it's not a place where you would read a book with pleasure. Uh, well, there is also some part of the greenery in the buildings, but it's, it's less, uh, let's say, the scale of these spaces is not sufficient. Uh, here in, in, in plants, I said uh, it also exists, but due to the sizes of these spaces, to the scale of these spaces, uh, they, uh, well, it's, it's more difficult to meet people there, simply. They are not as lively. Uh, looking at the configuration of analysis, actually, uh, from this drawing, uh, at this moment down, uh, we see that, uh, that uh, the analysis of connections uh, actually confirm this function in those sites. So, uh, when you have to note, you would have space for recreation, where people are meeting, where there are many people which are lively, and, and places which we just run to to get to our car or to the bus stop are much less attended. This is actually visible in this area. Yeah. Uh, and in CSS, the on the left, uh, you see that it's much more, you don't see it yet, but but uh, analyzing this and thinking about this, uh, I know this is, uh, the, the, the results really confirm that, uh, that uh, there is a certain relationship between uh, such pattern and, and usage of this piece. And here it's much more confusing. Uh, and uh, since the geometry is ruling this design, uh, without really thinking about how people would use this, uh, I would say that it's hard to, to, to read this space easily. So uh, those are two last slides for the uh, And so uh, what are the main observations? Why these two housing estates are sort of similar in terms of uh, typological buildings? Because there are high slabs of 11 floors. There are the smaller buildings of 12 floors. Uh, their distribution and configuration of space makes them uh, completely different, and also in terms of uh, how they are used by, by people. Uh, we might say that uh, perhaps the livability is somehow different in this case. We ever try to quantify that, I, I, I am not sure whether quantifying such concepts is a good idea, or there are such events. So, uh, why uh, we we might find a set of basic features, such as uh, uh, good access to nearby greenery, good uh, transportation connectivity. Uh, we also see this fragmentation due to the presence of historical structures. Uh, we might also observe that uh, there are quite obvious differences. The first uh, basic difference is uh, the uh, integration of historical fabric. In case of the Gilskastifana state, uh, even if those are large scale slabs, they still preserve the layout of perimeter block, in a sense. And there is this concentric sort of organization. In case of enclosed space, it's more geometrical. Uh, therefore, uh, the integration of historical structure is sort of uh, foreign to this logic. Uh, and, uh, well, all this leads to the uh, also, the problems with scale lead to this, that uh, 
performing whatever activities is a bit confusing. People simply don't know where to where to go to, to do certain things. There are playgrounds, but they are not so used. Let me go back, please, and do it like that. <coughs> So, uh, actually, <laughs> the analysis which, which was performed sort of confirmed the analyst critics, but also they give a bit more insights why these critics were provided. Uh, I would say that geometry is a lonely principle, it's not sufficient to, to, to provide proper design, uh, and uh, that this functionalist approach often usually used in modern economic states uh, doesn't produce really uh, proper outcomes. Uh, so while the housing states uh, satisfy the need for apartments for masses, uh, they are well connected, they offer abundant open space and greenery, uh, still, uh, there is a number of factors for improvement, such as the need for concourse of physical space and activities contained in these spaces. Uh, well, another thing is uh, the question of integrating cars, which is perhaps impossible, so they should be replaced by something else. Uh, another question is the integration of traditional structures. Perhaps they might uh, be used as a as an element to, to transform these uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and finally, uh, well, the very important part of this is strengthening of the role of green infrastructure as an ecological system. Uh, as further research, uh, we are thinking, much of myself, uh, to uh, examine further research, further states, and also to look for the possibility to, to apply I network analysis for, for visualizing the sociometric layouts and to overlap it with, uh, with various types of activities to be mapping uh, Thank you for your attention. I have a curiosity because you were talking about to evaluate the livability of urban forms and the outdoor spaces. Um, for every curiosity for the future research, do you think that it can be useful to integrate also the engagement of the citizen or stakeholder in order to evaluate also their perspective about the livability of these uh, places? in order also to maybe consider the, some changes in perspective after the COVID-19. Uh, yeah, yeah. As I said, this is a small piece of a larger project uh, and uh, one of my PhD students who has already started doing that. Uh, and we are working on, uh, on also a sort of quantitative framework for assessment of, uh, of exactly this, this housing estates. Um, so, so yes, we are thinking about that, and it's not just about COVID. It's also about you know there are very let's say intense uh, rehabilitation processes in our cities going on, which uh, focus on the downtown, which is 19th century. Uh, but due to these processes, these housing estates are slowly you know going down in terms of uh, real estate prices and they are they start deteriorating it's not yet the topic for discussion by the municipality but we are trying to, to start the debate in, in being a university uh, in order to attract because there are like 60 percent of people of citizens of our town living in these states it's not just this one this is a major part of town, but, uh, but there are also other building green fields in the outskirts. Uh, so, so, so yes, uh, absolutely, but it's impossible to, to, to you know, besides, I, 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 I simply like this uh, play with, you know, 
sociometric layout and, and looking, uh, examining these the places in between buildings. And I think that this might give some interesting results. Because we, I, I, I didn't show that, but because I don't think it's relevant in this the experiment with space syntax, for instance, that doesn't work with these modernist spaces. Because they are no complex, uh, you know. I, I'm, I'm simply looking for some other approach, uh, how to, how to, uh, you know, model this configuration in case of, uh, of, of uh, something which is completely different, like from other way of looking at space because it's hard to, to look at this as deterministic in the sense that you have got the street which leads somewhere you have got the square which would rather people and so on and so yeah yes we we do <laughs> and we are also looking at the same question about the use of the surveys uh, yeah yeah but participation but, yeah, you know, we are a research group. This is my specific child. Thank you. Thank you very much. The role of the chair. Yes. Maybe we can have a presentation. Again, I want to share uh, three slides about a special issue that I follow. Because if you want, you can because also teach it. Because I okay. can so I you, sure you share. Wouldn't, you wouldn't like this to appear through YouTube or anything. Okay. Or no, it depends, it's depends okay. on you. Go. No, 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 don't share. Don't worry. Okay. Not sharing. Mm -hmm. Sure. I will. I want only to uh, share a colorful paper that I follow with my colleagues from Politecnico di Torino for this special issue on sustainability. Sustainability is uh, uh, a journal, an open access journal that you reach now. The site is for equal to five. And uh, this special, special issue is titled on the water energy and we need the sustainable environment solution in the future. The research finds the use of vulnerability risk. It focuses in particular on the environment. Uh, and we would put the light to like the contribution about, uh, uh, I don't know, energy modeling uh, integrated with the uh, economic relation, the issues of system. The deadline is uh, the new PLC uh, <laughs> of 